Uh, if I could have your attention, I think we're ready to begin. Uh, so uh, let me just mention that uh, the slides uh, that, I'm, that I'm showing you, um, uh, excluding the paintings, you know, there are some maps and paintings. Uh, the rest of the slides I'm going to put, put on the course website. Uh, although you already have access to them because the course is being uh, video streamed, so all you have to do is really go to the videos. But it's going to be, it's going to be simpler for you to be able to uh, access the slides if they're just given to you as a block. So, uh, you know, uh, sometime uh, b uh, before week five, uh, because you'll be having the midterm around week five or six, uh, so sometime around the end of next week, I'm going to put up the slides for weeks one to four. Uh, and then after the midterm, I'll put up the second batch uh, and then before the final exam, I'll put up the third batch. So uh, let's say every three, three to four weeks. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is just to make it a little bit uh, convenient for you. Now, uh, before I begin, I want to uh, uh, go back to a map, uh, which I have not shown you. Um, and uh, uh, one of the students in this class pointed out to me quite correctly that the way that I had actually, uh, you know, uh, so if you look at this map, uh, you see over here, so this is Kolkata over here. And you know, I pointed out over, uh, around here, but, but obviously it's a bit further, bit further because as I said, the map before wasn't a map which actually gave you the detail. Uh, here you do get some relevant detail because this is a map of India in the time of Clive's about 1760. And so this is Kolkata here, this is Plassey over here, and this is Murshidabad over here. Uh, Plassey was basically, uh, a mango grove, so it's halfway between Murshidabad uh, and Kolkata, and, or Calcutta, as it used to be called. Um, and that is where, as you might recall, the battle in 1757, or so-called battle, took place. Now, uh, in my uh, concluding remarks to you uh, day before yesterday, I had brought up the narrative to 1764. Uh, and 1764 is uh, when we have, uh, if you look at this slide over here, the Battle of Buxar where, as you might recall, Mir Qasim, and once again, don't, don't worry excessively about the details. It's a highly convoluted story. It tells you quite a bit about, of course, uh, 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 you know, the, the British. Uh, part of the reason it's convoluted is because the Nawab of Bengal, Siraj Dola, over here, he's the person who uh, is going to be, if I may put it this way, deposed in a way, right? I mean, he's not deposed, he's defeated. Uh, by Clive, but that was because there was an arrangement that was made between Clive and, and the Nawab's uncle, a man by the name of Mir Jafar, who is then going to be installed as the Nawab. But then uh, in 1761, the British are going to be unhappy with Mir Jafar. They're going to depose him. They're going to put in place another member of the family, Mir Qasim, 1763. Then he's going to be deposed in turn, and Mir Jafar is going to be restored to the throne. So it's an it's, it's a, it's a, a unsavory, bitter kind of story. Uh, and a number of histor historians, especially writing from the Indian standpoint, have, have mentioned that the origins of British rule in India really lie in treachery and forgery uh, because of the arrangements that were made by the British with the Nawabs. Uh, but the gist of the matter, as far as we're concerned, for, for this part of the narrative is that in 1764, uh, Mir Qasim, uh, who has been deposed, uh, is going to ally himself with the Mughal emperor and the Nawab of Awadh. Uh, the Nawab of Awadh is, in, is, you know, Awadh is to the west, uh, and they're going to meet the company's forces uh, uh, at Buxar in 1764 and are going to suffer a defeat. Uh, and I want to just uh, um, uh, mention to you one little detail here, uh, because again we find that the armies are a bit lopsided. So the question was, how did uh, Major Hector Monroe, in 1764 it's not Clive, who's leading the army, all right? So it's a man by the name of Major Hector Munro. He leads 7,500 Indian troops to victory over, over the Mughal emperor and the Mir Qasim's armies. Uh, and, and, when we, and he was asked how uh, the troops uh, under him had won. Uh, he said that he had imposed, quote, regular discipline and strict obedience to orders, uh, which sounds, by the way, the sort of thing that you would expect an army general to do, right? Impose regular discipline and strict obedience but what this phrase doesn't tell you is that strict obedience meant, among other things, that soldiers who didn't perform or refused to perform, what are the punishments inflicted on them 
was they were tied to cannon and then the cannon was fired. So their bodies would, of course, hurl into the air and would fall into pieces, right? Which is a tactic that the British used, by the way, in 1857. In fact, there is a well-known American magazine which is still published down to the present day, which carried an article on exactly this strategy deployed by the British in 1857, 1858. I'm talking about the magazine called The Atlantic, uh, which is still published today. Uh, and that was one of the ways in which uh, Major Hector Monroe imposed discipline among his troops. All right, uh, worth noting. So now what, what is the situation then in 1765? Uh, seven, following the battle. What's going to happen is that the company is going to acquire the rights to the Divani. What does that mean? It means very simply that the company has now assumed the rights that belonged to the Nawab of Bengal. They have become, in fact, the Nawabs, in a manner of speaking. They're not going to be called the Nawabs. But they have assumed the role of the Nawab. And what was the principal role of the Nawab? Other than such things as imposing law and order on his territories, or something that you would expect, again, every ruler to do, to whatever extent they did it, right? The major function was to collect the revenues and then dispatch these revenues to the Mughal emperor. Because remember that the Nawab of Bengal is still a vassal or a slave, if you want to call it that, that's not obviously the right word here, but that he is in fact actually reporting to the Mughal emperor. What w was happening, of course, is that very often the Mughal emperor couldn't control these Nawabs because many of them splintered off. Uh, but, but, but to some extent, the Nawabs were still conveying some other revenue. So let's say you collect, just take a random figure, just as an illustration, you collect, let's say, 5 million pounds, the equivalent of 5 million pounds, while well, you transmit a certain portion of that to the Mughal Emperor's treasury. Now the company is doing that, but they are keeping, of course, a substantial portion of the revenue for themselves, for themselves. And one of the consequences of company rule is going to be that there is going to be enormous increase in private trading, enormous increase in private trading. The governor of Madras, a few years later, is going to serve in that position for only two years. And this governor of Madras in 1760s, just to give you an illustration of what is happening here, 1768 to 70, in two years he amasses a private fortune of 800,000 pounds. All right? 800,000 pounds in those days was an astronomical sum of money. An astronomical sum of money. You're talking about the equivalent of tens of millions of dollars today. Right? So this is, the, this is essentially the situation. Now let's try to understand it in a slightly different language. What are the consequences uh, of um, the, uh, the conquest, uh, the fact that the company acquires a right to Divani here? Let me also show you a couple more slides actually first, uh, just so that you see how it's been represented by artists. So this is a famous painting, which is a contemporary painting. Uh, which shows Clive here, and this is Mir Jafir, okay? Uh, so this is the oriental despot. Uh, and, you know, of course, the elephant was always, you know, the symbol of the royalty and so on. And, uh, and uh, the more famous painting in some respects, well, they're equally famous, uh, this painting, which used to hang in the offices of the East India Company, okay, in, in London. Uh, and what does this show? This is... Uh, the East offering her wealth to the West, okay? That's what it's called, offering. I mean, you, you, you can interpret this yourself. So, and this is, this is India, this represents India over here. Uh, and this is a basket full of, you can, you can tell even with the fact it's not a very high resolution picture, jewels, diamonds, rubies, whatever it is, jewelry, right? So this is, there's a very elaborate representation, I mean interpretation that's been done of the painting uh, by many others. And there in the background you see, by the way, a sailing ship over there. So, you know, it gives you some indication of uh, the context over there. Yes? Why is it black? Why is it black? The figure. Yeah. The figure. You know, very often Indians were viewed as black. I mean, uh, this is the, in, in fact, uh, in many of the presidency towns, the Indian portion was called Black Town. So there was, yeah. there was an equivalent of like, say, people 
Oh, well, no, no, no. This, uh, you know, the, the reference, uh, the context of black, you see the thing is that now we might think of color shadings and we might think about brown and so forth and so on. The opposition was black and white. That's, that's how it worked. Yeah, okay, that's, that's how it worked principally. But as I said, the key, I mean, the best way to answer that question is, is the illustration I gave you, that, that the, the native portion of the presidencies was always called black town, black town, all right? So now, uh, let's, getting back to the narrative, and we've got several things we have to think about. One thing we have to think about is the political history, all right? Just keep in mind what are the things that you have to, political history of India 1765 and onwards, changing relations between the company and parliament, okay? Um, changing relations between company and parliament, uh, the social history of India at that time, and when I say social history, again, there are many aspects, and we're only going to look at one of them, which is the one explored by Dalrymple, which I had alluded to in my previous lecture. I want to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the economic consequences, uh, including something called the Bengal famine, which we're going to look at in some detail, of 1769, okay? Um, and uh, relations between Britain and India, right? relations between Britain and India. But before we get to these five large considerations, right, the question I want to uh, raise for you once again, I've raised it before many times, uh, or at least several times, and I want to raise it once again, uh, before we move on to the next section here, and that is the question that is raised by Thomas Metcalf in his Concise History, of which you have been reading portions as well. What one, might, one must ask, he says, page 53, impelled a 150-year-old trading company suddenly to embark on a career of conquest. You know, this, this question for, for historians like myself remains fundamental to try to understand how did this happen. And I know there was a question early on in, you know, maybe uh, two weeks ago, um, lecture two or three, I forget, where the question was, uh, you know, can we think of the, had the company really thought of conquest right from the outset? Had it embarked on conquest? And I, I remember saying, very clearly that no, it's not as though there was a blueprint that in the 1600s that the company knew that it was going to eventually conquer India, they were laying the groundwork for this, nothing of that sort. But what's happened certainly, of course, is that the, that the company have now become, uh, or the British have now become rulers, not just traders. And how were the British, that's the second question, again the one that I've repeatedly asked, and how were the British so easily able to carve out a state for themselves? among the contending powers of post-Mughal India, right? which is a question I've addressed. I said, well, what was happening to the Mughals? Why were the Marathas not able to actually acquire power? And again, I haven't given you the full picture there because that would, be, that would be a very complex story, but one of the things I pointed out was that the Marathas are based in Western India. Uh, all that's very interesting that, that Calcutta, 1742, the company in 1742, this is, sev this is more than a decade before the conquest, the company built what is called the Maratha Ditch, which was a kind of a large ditch surrounding Calcutta because the Marathas would conduct these lightning raids and even though Bengal was 1,000 miles away at the eastern end of the country, they were often able to do that. But you can't take over a possession with a lightning raid. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an army, the Marathas are good for guerrilla warfare and they're able to establish a large chain of forts in their own vicinity in Western India. But places like Delhi, Calcutta, they were, all they were able to do was really just conduct these lightning raids, you know, pillage, loot, so forth and so on. Uh, and certainly for reasons that I've described in my previous lecture, which I'm not going to go over again, they had already become a considerably weakened force. Now Metcalf continues, as neither Clive nor the company had devised a coherent plan, right? There's no blueprint. Much was the product of circumstance. So things happen willy-nilly, you know, almost much. You know, the Mughals have weakened, the Marathas have weakened. Uh, there is a kind of a imperial power vacuum. Uh, it's, not, it's not as though there aren't regional kingdoms and the Nawabs are not there. 
uh, the, the, the Indians have been caught unawares, you could say. I don't think Metcalf and many others give sufficient attention to that. Right? That, th there wasn't really the sense that some fundamental cataclysmic change might take place with the coming uh, of the British. So forth and so on. And then page 55, he again re asks the same question. But quote, but why did the East India Company succeed so spectacularly in India when others, European and Indian, did not? Much of the answer lies in Europe, an island nation for whom overseas trade was vital. Britain was committed to securing its Indian interests at all costs. Control of the seas in an era in which the export trade brought the greatest profit gave Britain an edge over all rivals. Something I have pointed out explicitly when I suggested to you in one of my early comments that what you see with the coming of the Portuguese and then the English is the shift from land powers to maritime powers, the, the beginning of the maritime phase you know, of uh, Indian history. Right? So there, there are all of these kinds of considerations, I think, that we would have to really keep in mind. Yes? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, we're not rehearsing all the details now, right, uh, of all the reasons. But, you know, so yes, I mean, and that's in part, you know, he, 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 he talks about something that I had mentioned as well, you know, the war of the uh, Austrian succession, you know, proxy wars in India, elimination of European rivals. Yes, all of that. But I'm saying at the end of the day, there's still an element of uncertainty about how this became possible. I, I don't think we can offer a authoritative, decisive account of both these questions, right? Why, how is it that the British were able to succeed? Uh, and how does one really explain the transformation from being traders to rulers? There's some sense uh, of uncertainty that we still have about that. Now, so getting to the five main considerations. Let me begin before I go to the political um, uh, and economic aspects of that history. Let me begin with William Dalrymple with the social history. I had uh, started talking about this and I promised that I would return to it. Right? So this is, this is the book, uh, White Moguls, from which you're reading, you know, as I said, you know, uh, 30, 40, well, 70 odd pages, but I said the first 30, 40 pages might be uh, the ones that you might want to pay more attention to. Um, and let's just look at a few passages uh, uh, very briefly. Uh, so that we understand what are some of the questions that really are at stake. Okay, so he says, bottom of page six, yet the more one probes in the records of the period, uh, the more one realizes, and he's talking about the 1700s. The bulk of his evidence is from the second half of the 1700s, moving into the early 1800s. Recall that early 1800s, a picture is going to change. The racial element is going to creep in. Uh, the submission here by Dalrymple is that the racial element was not that strong. Yes, of course the British know that they're different, they're white, all of that. Uh, and that painting that we just saw in Lorenzo's question, why is she black? Well, you, the black-white distinction is overt. Right? Nonetheless, the racial element is, is not strong in social interactions according to this line of reasoning as propounded by Dalrymple, and, and I think that there is an argument uh, to be made about that. Right? So, but, but, he, but he points out in the early pages that in fact this was true of the 1600s as well. All throughout the 1600s, the same argument that he's making prevails. That in short, in the first 150 years of the British presence in India, and preceded by that by the Portuguese presence in India, one finds that there was a certain kind of multiculturalism. Uh, that's a word that he uses. It's a word that I dislike for various reasons, uh, because multiculturalism is very often actually the imposition from the top. It's not organic, uh, what, although he means to say it's organic. But when I say imposition from the top, I mean that when, for example, a state, uh, the United States being a good example, a country says that it's dedicated to multiculturalism, right? So that means that, well, you know, we're going to promote certain kinds of policies. But again, these is, this is coming from the top, right? The question is whether there is that, that urge for multiculturalism from the bottom, from the bottom, right? 
And of course, we would have to then define what exactly we mean when we speak about something called multiculturalism. You know, is this another uh, thing invented by white liberals to make themselves feel good, for example? Right? It's an argument that's been made by many people coming from a left point of view. Uh, all right. So yet the more one probes on the records of the period, the more one realizes that there were in fact a great many Europeans at this period who responded to India in a way that perhaps surprises and appeals to us today by crossing over from one culture to the other. These are very strong words. He's not simply saying that, oh, you know, uh, the English kind of liked India and so forth. Crossing over from one culture to the other. Englishmen who abandoned their dress when they went to India, started wearing Indian dress, all right? Englishmen who started consorting entirely with Indians and sometimes, uh, quote, converted to Hinduism. Yeah, there's a man called Hindu Stuart, he was called. You know, Stuart was his English name, he becomes, well, what does it mean to convert to Hinduism? You really can't convert to Hinduism, right? But the point is that, well, he, you know, this particular person embraces Hindu habits, so forth and so on. And wholeheartedly embraced, continues Dalrymple, the great diversity of late Mughal India. So now you see this is being written from the, van, from the point of view of a white liberal who says, yeah, you know, the Mughals were in fact an extraordinarily ecumenical and diverse people. That empire was extraordinarily diverse and the English arrived there um, and, the, and many of them realized that, well, actually, you know, uh, Indian habits not only suit us better, but this is a much more cosmopolitan civilization. So, 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 so far, you might think to yourself, well, this is a narrative that should appeal to Vinaylal at least, right? Because that's the kind of thing I've been arguing. But then we want to see, well, what might be possibly some of the problems? Because then let's, let's continue with what he says. Beneath the familiar story of European conquest and rule in India and the imposition of European ways in the heart of Asia, there always lay a, more, a far more intriguing and still largely unwritten story. And that's the story Dalrymple says I'm going to now narrate in this book. And what is that far more intriguing and still largely unwritten story? And I quote, page seven, the Indian conquest of the European imagination. Now, you see, I think that this is where it's starting to get quite far-fetched. There is no question, by the way, that India loomed very large in the European imagination particularly in the imagination of European intellectuals and writers, romantic poets. You know, uh, Germany, German intellectuals were awash in Indian ideas, all right? Uh, the great Goethe, uh, the greatest figure of humanism and probably in European thought, you know, thought that the most majestic play that had ever been written was written by this Indian playwright called Kalidas. So this is going to be the European discovery of India in the 1770s, 80s, 90s, moving into the early 1800s. For those of you who read French, although there's a translation in English as well, there's a book by Raymond Schwab uh, called The Oriental Renaissance. And the whole book, this massive uh, work, is basically about European intellectuals and their fascination for India, right? So you, say, you might say that, I, okay, here also Dalrymple is giving a story that at least some people know. Uh, but you see what's going to happen here is as you continue on, um, the narrative becomes one of where, yes, the British conquered India in the material, physical, economic sense, but India conquered Britain intellectually, culturally, right? Now, I think that's really a stretch uh, because then we would have to see what were the fundamental transformations uh, in England. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What were the Indian kind of reactions to Hinduism? We 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 don't know much. We don't know much because because the, the you know uh, let me put it to you this way, okay? Um, because this is a question that comes up constantly, right? Conquest of Bengal. Why don't we have Indian sources? We don't really have Indian sources, right? We're Europeans. You know this great Bengali writer, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee late 19th century. So here's a passage. He says, you know, the Englishman, he goes out on a hunt. And while he's going out on a hunt, you know, he starts sneezing. So then he takes out the handkerchief from his 
you know, pants from his trouser pockets, blows his nose, and then he puts a handkerchief back in there. And he says, you know, how do we know all this? Because he writes about it. He's so conceited that he thinks that every sneeze of it is something that we should know about. Right? And he says, you know, in India we had great empires and they fell to pieces and we don't even know anything about these empires. No one bothered to write about them. Right? That, that's his narrative. Now, that's partly the answer. Right? Yes, there are a few scattered things here and there if you really look around, but no. You don't really find, I mean, I think you're going to, that doesn't mean Indians aren't writing, of course. There's a <laughs> intensely literate culture among the Brahmins, you know, but yes, there are theological treatises, there are treatises on aesthetics, the, you know, law, so forth and so on. But you don't get, you really, a, a sense of what the Indians might be thinking about. There's not at this time. Later on, you will. 19th century, yes. But I'm talking about 1600s moving into the 1700s. Virtually all Englishmen, he continues, right, in India at this period, Indianized themselves to some extent. So to Indianize yourself meant that you started eating Indian food. Some even became vegetarians. Now that was miraculous, an Englishman becoming vegetarian uh, in the mid-1700s. Uh, my God, uh, you know, th th that was a novelty, right? Uh, they started wearing Indian dress. They started smoking the hookah, the hookah, which became immensely popular, by the way, in the U.S. as well. Uh, in the late 1700s, 1800s, there's a body of work on that. Right? All of this, these are the ways in which you, and of course, consorting with Indian women. I mean, that, that was one of the main things in this picture, right? So, and he continues in this same vein. So what's happening here? That India has a way of taming its conquerors, you know? It has a way of taming its conquerors. It's this kind of sponge th theory, if I may put it this way. So let, let me just read out that last, and then I'll take your question, right? So India has always had, I'm quoting him, India has always had a strange way with her conquerors. In defeat, she beckons them in, then slowly seduces, assimilates, and transforms them. You know, India is, you know what's happening here, by the way? This is where discourse becomes gendered. India is actually a feminine entity. This is what women do. They slowly seduce, assimilate, and here you have Britain, this great masculine entity. That's what it is. So you see, this is where my problem is with a man whom uh, otherwise you might think that, well, he's got a very sympathetic account. He's saying the, you know, the English actually, you know, Indianized themselves. You know, they knew that they were in some ways inferior actually to the people that they were going to eventually conquer. But no, I think we're going to have to really parse. And this is what it means to sort of do a political reading of a text. So I'll take the question that you had. I went to London and my yeah. grandmother took me out to Indian food and I said, oh, you Indian food in London? And she said, you, the best Indian food is in London. Well, that I, that I, can, I will dispute, but, but <laughs> because I've heard, I've heard that account also. Uh, you know, there's, there's Indian food and there's Indian food. That you do get good Indian food, but uh, whether it's the best or not is something. But, yeah, although I might say, by the way, now that London, by the way, has, it is estimated about... 14,000 Indian restaurants, yes. And in Britain, every year they have a competition for who prepares the best Indian food. Uh, Indian food has now been served uh, as part of a state dinner, yeah. you know, by the queen. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lorenzo, I might have to just, because we, we want, uh, I'm very happy to take questions all the time, but we have to get on with, uh, with the narrative, okay? So, you know, and I could really continue on in this vein, but this is what, uh, you know, and, and he gives stories about, as I said, people like Hindu Stewart, you know, Englishmen who, you know, they seldom married, by the way. This very, very seldom married Indian women. Uh, uh, they took them as concubines, as mistresses, lived with them, and practically, you could say, uh, under common law, they lived as husband and wife. Uh, in, in many cases. But, you know, we would have to get into technicalities. That's a whole lecture by itself because uh, you can live uh, as hus husband and wife, so to speak, in a, in a colloquial way, but that doesn't give the woman rights of inheritance when her husband dies. Uh, 
then we'd have to look, well, how many of these women were able to inherit their husband's property, so forth and so on, etc. Right? This is where it, it, the narrative would start to get really uh, much more complicated. And what Dalrymple is going to say uh, uh, is that uh, you know, ideas of racial hierarchy, if you go to page 39, uh, this is where he first makes the argument explicitly that ideas of racial and ethnic hierarchy began to circulate uh, in the 1780s and certainly by the early 1800s had become actually predominant. Uh, I can tell you that there are letters that I have read, unpublished letters and archives, for example, uh, uh, dating to the 1820s, 1830s, where Englishmen would routinely refer to Indians as with the N-word. Okay, yeah, Lit literally, in the 1820s and 30s, this is happening routinely. Right? So, uh, but I bring all of this before you because uh, typically when one does this period, one simply does, oh, this is what the company is doing, these are the changes, but we have to think about what were the nature of social you know, interactions between um, the English um, and the Indians, all right? Now, uh, let me turn to, so I pointed out five main themes, so let me turn to the second, which is, uh, the Bengal famine. So 1765, right? So Diwani, so we're in that period. Bengal famine of 1769-70. This famine is estimated to have wiped out anywhere between a fourth to a third of the entire population of Bengal in a period of less than 24 months. Minimum 10 million deaths. Uh, we can't be precise about the figures, that's for sure. We don't really have enough information to be able to say that. But, you know, this is, this is uh, the estimate that has been arrived at by most of the people who have really looked at this period in detail. Okay. Um, uh, there was a severe, so there were reports, by the way, of food shortages in 1768. Um, 1769, you have a drought. Uh, even though there are these reports of shortages, uh, the company didn't do anything at all. Uh, the company took absolutely no action at all. Uh, so these reports were, I'm saying, ignored by the, by the company. All right. Uh, now, there are some interesting aspects to this that we need to really think about. Okay. Uh, one of which is that we know uh, from the documentary uh, evidence uh, including uh, what appears in parliamentary reports. Uh, one of the main sources for the study of British India is what are called parliamentary reports. Um, and these parliamentary reports were voluminous uh, for any given year, by the way. So parliamentary reports were not just on India, they were on, on any, any subject. Uh, parliamentary reports on, on uh, you know, British possessions uh, elsewhere in the world, on what's happening in, in Ireland, on railways in India. Uh, for any given year, uh, I don't know if the UCLA library has a whole set, uh, but uh, for any given year, you might get you know about 7,500 volumes, uh, and each of these volumes is about a thousand pages. You know, massive. Uh, so you, you would need you would need all of Bunch Hall and more to fill up uh, you know uh, the the parliamentary reports. So, but there's there's quite a bit of evidence about about what's happening in India from there. Uh, we know that the British had in, that the, at the time when the famine was about to peak in April 1770. In 1770, in fact, the British uh, one of the things that they did was they actually increased the revenues. Okay, they actually increased the revenues uh, from 10 percent to 50 percent of agricultural produce. Um, because a company uh, is basically, uh, 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 the, the view the company had was, we have to make sure that we are able to extract whatever revenue can. You know, uh, if, uh, if, if it so happens that the social conditions don't permit most people to actually pay uh, the, um, uh, uh, you know, the uh, assessment, because there's an assessment, uh, well, then that's the problem as it were. Right? And of course, if you didn't pay the assessment, then either the land was forfeited, confiscated by the state, or it would be sold by the state. Right? Right? So, so one, of the, uh, one of the reasons for this, uh, for the famine I'm saying to you, that there is, a, there is a drought, yes, but there's shortages. But it's important to remember an argument which, which I had mentioned at the very outset in lecture one, when I was giving you an overview. Uh, 
and I want to now reiterate this. This is an argument made by Amartya Sen, uh, an Indian economist who's uh, also won the Nobel Prize, not for work he did on this question. He's probably one of the wor world's leading authorities on famine, on famines, writ written widely on famines. And one of the arguments that he had made was that famines do not occur in democracies. They only occur in authoritarian states or non-democratic states of some kind or the other. Because exactly for the reason that we pointed out that in, in democracies there's some degree of accountability. So, you know, as has in China. China, of course, was not even remotely a democracy. 1959 to 62, uh, estimated 40 million people died uh, in China. I mean, it's a genocide, uh, literally. Uh, and again, you, we know that Chinese Communist Party officials were receiving reports uh, about famines and completely ignored them, you know, for various reasons, right? So in other words, if you, if you, if you begin with the assumptions that famines are, you know, natural disasters, that is an incorrect assumption to begin with, highly erroneous and misleading, all right? So what we are saying, and what's important, as Sen points out, and many others have pointed out, he's not the only one to point that out, that same century, seven, so before the conquest, and before 1769-70, from the 1700s, in that century, there hadn't been any famine in Bengal at all. Right? There hadn't been any famine in Bengal. And you could argue, uh, and we'll return to this subject later on, that in some respects, in some respects, British rule is bookended by famines. It begins with a great famine and it ends with another calamitous famine. And that also is going to be in Bengal. That's the Bengal famine of 1943. Uh, this is when World War II is taking place. Um, there is a book written very recently by Madhu Shri Mukherjee. Uh, again, not the only person who has worked on it, but this is a very recent book uh, where, she's, where she uh, states explicitly and cites evidence that while people were starving in Bengal, food was being shipped out from Bengal to Australia because that's where you, know, you, needed, you needed to feed the troops, right? And the Pacific theater of the war, right? This, so this is the problem that we're really talking about. And what is that problem? If we put it in analytical terms, that the beginning of company rule is a beginning of absolute irresponsibility, right? That that this is really the meaning of colonialism in some sense, is that there is no system of accountability, there is no system of responsibility. And yes, again, there may be, might be possible to argue that, well, you know, th that this is what the British brought to India, they brought the railways or this or that, but let's not forget the key argument. And what's also clear at this point in time, this is not going to be true when the famines of the 18... 80s and 1890s are going to take place when the British had in place a system of relief. At this time, there is no relief. There are no relief operations to alleviate the hunger, the starvation, the misery of the people. All right. Uh, one of the other reasons, I'll t turn to you in just a moment, one of the other reasons why the famine occurs is that in order to maximize its profits, the company was in fact, encouraging the destruction of food crops, all right? And when I say food crops, I mean such things obviously as rice in, to be replaced by cash crops. And what would be the two principal cash crops in the Bengal? Remember, Bengal is a huge swath of land, including present-day Bihar, Jharkhand, Orissa, right? What would be those two cash crops? Opium, poppies, and secondly, indigo dye. Right? A, a dye which is used for textiles. Right? Uh, so this is, giving you a short narrative, if you're interested uh, on the internet, you'll find, you can look at a journal called the Oxford Journal, 1771, March 23rd, an article published, contemporary article, 1771, March 23rd, where a woman says, who was, who was a witness, all right, says very clearly that, you know, even at that time, there were reliable reports in Calcutta of at least two million deaths, right? And this is 1771. Her awareness, of course, of what is happening is only awareness of what's happening in certain parts. If you go to Birbhum, which is sort of uh, north uh, of Calcutta, uh, 
it has been said that Birbhum returned to the jungle, meaning that the peasants, you know, had either died or they had abandoned their farms, right? And so basically this place now is slowly going to turn back into a jungle, right? This is what we're really speaking about when we speak of the famine of 1769-70. And so what Ramesh Chandra Dutt, uh, and I'll take the question after this, Ramesh Chandra Dutt, who's an Indian uh, nationalist writing much later in Economic History of India, uh, writing around 1900, he, what's his assessment of what's really going on? He says that, quote, a change came over India under the rule of the East India Company. And the company, quote, simply considered India as a vast estate or plantation, the profits of which were to be withdrawn from India and deposited in Europe, end quote. Yes. Uh, so the famine was largely caused by the company's policies. You could say that. You could say that, but you could say that it was precipitated also by the drought. There is a drought. But this is what I mean. We have to, we have to understand that, that a drought doesn't necessarily lead to a famine. Okay? It doesn't necessarily lead to because it, then it depends on what the policies are, what the policies are of the state. Okay? In this case, we're talking about the policies of the company. Remember that the Nawabs have now basically, they have lost jurisdiction. Right? This is, they have really lost control over their territory. So this is really under the jurisdiction of the company. And your question uh, is a question that allows me to move into the third important set of questions that we have to think about. Because the question here that you're really asking, if we pursue its implications, are who is really responsible now, in a way, for, for India, for Bengal, for the Bengal? for what is called Bengal at this point in time. Right? The Nawabs have, as is clear, really lost control. You, there's a kind of a social anomie, a kind of a lawlessness in a way, all right? A kind of a disorder. Um, we're going to find that the right of sati, which we are going to talk about at much greater length later on, okay? So the right of sati is what is called widow immolation, okay? So the right of sati is where when a woman, a married woman, uh, could be a married girl, by the way, could be a married girl, um, and that is that she, 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 a very young uh, female, uh, not a mature woman, uh, is the right of sati is when a married woman loses her husband, then she goes into the funeral pyre of her husband. So while her husband's body is being burned, because in Hindu, you know, Hindus burn the dead, right? So she would, she would sit in the funeral pyre and then she would be burned to death as well. Now, it became highly controversial, you know, how widespread was it? Why do I mention it in this context? Because we know that in fact, the right of sati increased substantially at this point in time. Right? For those who have argued that, well, it was always prevalent in India, well, in fact, actually, there isn't much evidence to, spawn, to, to support that view. Uh, uh, certainly not on a uh, India-wide scale. All right? Uh, so, but, but we we're going to return to the question of sati, but I mention it now because we're trying to indicate that there's, this is a period of what you might call social anomie. That is that there's a kind of a disorder, lawlessness, uh, loss of loss of self in some ways, loss of identity, these things have become actually quite important. Who, in fact, is really in charge? The company is interested in, in self-aggrandizement, in increasing its profits, principally. Yes? So the women who died because of the drought, that included the working people in the ones that were I I didn't I didn't catch. Can you just speak up a bit? Yeah. Is that number included in the one-third to one-third of people? Oh, oh yeah, but you know, the, I mean, the, when I say the right of sati uh, increase, we're not talking about millions and millions. We're, we're just saying that, okay, if there happened to be, let's say, 25 incidents of sati, uh, let's say in 1750, just take randomly a figure, right? Well, now you're going to find that it's gone up tenfold. So yeah, it, 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 when we're saying the number, what, what, it, let's try to understand the significance. The, the significance is that those who are most vulnerable are the first to die, okay? Uh, women are more vulnerable for various reasons, okay, than men. 
And what we're going to find is that also when there is this kind of social anomie, there is a kind of a scapegoating. Okay, so let's, let's put it this way, okay, that you have a family, and in this family, right, you find that, well, now there's hardly enough food to go around. Someone has going to have to forego the food. Who is that someone going to be? It could be elderly people first. All right, that, well, they are pretty much le reach their lifespan. Now, this is, you know, sounds horrendous, right? To, but this is how people will think in these moments, right? Okay. A, a, a woman who has already born children is more vulnerable than a woman who hasn't because a woman is valued in part for her reproductive rights and functions. Right? So th th we'd have to think about all of that. I, I, we can't look into the complexities of this, but this is all part of the picture of what I talk about when I mean that there's a kind of a se sense of social dislocation. The key question, in a sense, is what is the nature of authority? Who's exercising it? All right. Now that brings me to relations between the company and parliament, which is a long, complicated story, but we need to really... Um, uh, look at this story in, in some detail. Let me just uh, uh, see if I can find, uh, I think I've, uh, one moment. Yeah, okay, so uh, uh, what, what uh, is uh, crucial over here is 1783, uh, 1773, uh, Lord North's Act of 1773, seven, and then we have what's called uh, uh, in the, uh, Pitt's in the Act of 1784. Before we get to that, let's put it in the general framework. Even in the 1740s, 1750s, 1760s, before Buxar, before Diwani, Parliament was getting concerned about the company. Because what's, what is a company? It, it's actually a state without being a state in many ways. It doesn't have the responsibilities of a state. States have responsibilities to their subjects, don't they? Right? Uh, I mean, they can extract revenue from you or taxes today, but they also have some responsibilities. They're supposed to provide you with certain kinds of benefits, roads, public library system, schooling, you know, a great many other things. There's a, so if an ap epidemic takes place, well, the st state has some functions, right? It's supposed to secure the area, ensure that, you know, uh, people are safe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The company, what are its responsibilities? This is what Parliament is getting concerned about, putting it in the, in the broadest framework right, that you can think about. Now, before we get back to that, think of a second set of questions related to that. If you are... The company is located in London, its headquarters, and its officials in India are taking orders, or supposed to be taking orders very often from the company's headquarters. And, and particularly after 1765, when the company acquires a right to Diwani, Parliament understands that now the company has become actually a ruling power. It's a state in itself. And so w what they want to do in Parliament, the British Parliament, is they want to try to be able to curtail its powers to some degree. Okay? But the second set of questions is, um, what is one of the problems we're trying to convey the company's orders? So let's say the company headquarters, uh, and when we talk about what's the structure of the company, important to uh, mention that to some extent, okay? The structure of the company. So you have something called the board of control. Uh, the, you have directors. This is going to be formalized in what is called the board of control if you look at 1784. But even before that, there was something equivalent to that in a way. You had a directorate of the company. Um, and then you have a court of proprietors. So what is a court of proprietors? A court of proprietors consists of about 2,000 people uh, who uh, each of them had a vote. Okay? Uh, and in order to be a member of the court of proprietors, you had to hold stock uh, worth to the value of 1,000 pounds, and you must have held it for at least one calendar year. So if you were a stockholder, you had 1,000 pounds minimum of stock. They were obviously stockholders who had gr greater 
amount, right? Uh, you could be a member of the court of proprietors. Uh, and, uh, but the, the chief decision making, okay, so there were some uh, policy decisions that had to be approved by the court of proprietors. But the chief decision making body lay with what is called the board of control. Uh, one of the things that Pitt's India Act of 1784 did was the president of the board of control became a member of the British cabinet. So this is a cabinet rank position, okay? So uh, you're part of the inner circle now around the prime minister. That's what we're really speaking about here, all right? So you've got the board of control, you've got the court of proprietors. Now there is correspondence. So here's, here's a simple question, There's a very simple answer, but I, want you, I just want to pose a question to you. The question was, so let's say 1765, 1770, whenever, the company says, okay, this is what we want officials in India to do. What is one of the problems with implementing that, you think? It takes forever for the messages to go from London to... As London. simple as that. You, the company's headquarters comes up with some policy, right? It's going to be a year before anyone sitting in Calcutta is going to know about it, or six months. And, by, and then, you know, and, and if they want to respond to it, I mean, this is not the telephone internet age. Don't forget, you know? And you don't have, you don't, you don't have, you know, the steam engine and all of that at this point. I mean, even a passage by sea took many months, right? So one of the things that's happening, this is key really, is what I call the man on the spot. You see, the, the, the governor, the, the company officials, you know, they very often said, we don't really care what the official back in London is saying to us. How are they going to exercise control over us anyhow? So let's say they issue a recall and say, oh, you know, uh, we're going to recall this official because this official has engaged in malfeasance, you know, has accepted bribes, and we've got evidence of that. So by the time, you know, the guy might even be dead by the time the order actually reaches, you know, I mean, it, to put it candidly, right? So the man on the spot is the, there's an argument which is going to develop at this point in time. It's going to become a key argument that is going to be used by the British for the next 150 years. And that is what I call the man on the spot. The person who is on the spot knows best. That was the British view, essentially. So when, uh, let's jump to 150 years later, to 1919, when what is called the Jallianwala Bag or Amritsar Massacre takes place, 1919. So this is, a, now this India is very much part of, of course, India's uh, ruled by the British for a long time at this point in time. So General Dyer is a British official who is going to uh, basically order 50 troops under his command to fire upon a gathering of Indians, a political gathering which had been banned by the British. Um, and th they are gathered in this sort of garden, it's called. It's really a kind of a, a large, unkept piece of land. It, that's what it was. And there was only one entrance and exit, just one. And this is blocked by the 50 troops. And General Dyer's troops just start firing. And they kill according to the official British account. The Indian nationalist account was much higher. The official British account is 379 Indians dead. Right? And they're murdered, basically. And, the, and what's going to happen? By now you should know a parliamentary inquiry, inquiry, right? A committee of inquiry is going to sit down, right? And there's going to look into what happened. and. General Dyer is frankly more or less going to be exonerated. Yes, they have to say some nasty things about him. Oh, you know, he. But what's the argument? You know, we in London, we can't really tell what was happening. The, he was there on the spot. He knows. He knew what the pressures were. He knew what the pressures were. This, is, this argument goes back to the 1760s, 70s. This is vital. Because what we're saying is that whatever the company headquarters may say, the question simply was, how accountable are officials back in India? So what the company is seeking to do, what parliament is seeking to do, uh, because of course the man of the spot argument was used more for such things as, you know, there's a disturbance uh, or 
the British are going to annex a state. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about annexation. Uh, because remember, at this point in time, you go back to this map for a second, all right? Uh, uh, India at the time of Clive here. So this is B Bengal. Here you can see Bengal marked here. This is Bengal. This is what is coming under the jurisdiction of the company at this time. But, but this is the land mass here of India. There's still a lot of territory. And, and uh, one of our stories is going to be obviously the expansion of British rule. How did all the rest of India eventually come under British jurisdiction? Uh, there were going to be native states all the time, that is at states that the British did not directly absorb uh, into British Indian territories. They let alone the rulers, but the rulers did not have the authority to conduct foreign treaties with, with rulers, uh, overseas rulers. They didn't have the authority uh, you know, to have uh, their own communication networks over them and so on. So, uh, but uh, this, by the way, is Avad, O-U-D-H, also spelled A-W-A-D-H. So that Battle of Buxar I was talking about, 1764, right? When I said that the Mughal emperor's armies, here is Delhi, okay, the Mughal emperor, the Nawab of Avad and Mir Qasim, who, who based here, the three of them are going to, this is the Nawab, so the, the Nawab of Avad sits here in Lucknow, all right? Why am I showing you this right now? Because we're simply saying that one of the things, at this point in time, we're simply talking about Bengal, but eventually we're going to find that there's going to be expansion of British rule, right, in the rest of India. Now, uh, going back to that question, so the man on the spot, I, I, the man of the spot is the one who knows best, but this is an argument used principally in relation to military questions, certain kinds of political questions. Annexation, Avad is going to be annexed by the British in 1856. And when this question comes up, well, why have you annexed it? Again, argument, man on the spot knows best. However, notwithstanding that, what is important is that in some domains, the British, the Parliament, are going to be able to actually rein in the company. So what the company is going to, what Parliament is going to do, right? So this is what I mean, parliamentary exercise of control over company, which I've su suggested started in the 17. 40s and 50s because of the fear that the company was becoming a state within a state, right? That was the fear. And then, of course, the company acquires the rights to the Divani, so now this has become a critical question. So the first piece of legislation is Lord North's Act. Who is Lord North? He's the British Prime Minister, right? He's the British Prime Minister. Um, and so, it, 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 so he pushes through Parliament an act, which is an act of 1773, the two main features of this act that concern us is it establishes formally a court of proprietors. I've already mentioned that. And it establishes a Supreme Court of Bengal. The judges of which were all going to be nominated in Britain itself, they were going to be nominated in Britain, all right? Uh, and this court would have jurisdiction over all affairs of not just Britishers, but Indians as well, right? So this was going to be the supreme authority, right? And then further on, and then we'll get back to the 1770s, further on we have what is called P Pitt's India Act of 1784, which establishes the Board of Control. One other thing that happened in 1773, Lord North's Act, which is crucial, I haven't mentioned here, is that India was going to be under the jurisdiction of somebody called the Governor General of India. For the first time, Clive is not Governor General, he's just, a, he's just an army man, right? He's, he's a commander. Uh, and, we, and I've already given you the history of Clive in brief that you know, he goes back to, uh, you know, goes back to India, uh, I mean back to Britain, then he comes to India again, you know, uh, and you remember 1772, there is a parliamentary inquiry against him. 1774, he commits suicide. Right? Um, so what I'm talking about here, when I say governor general, is that this is a new position. And the first person who's going to assume that position is a man called Warren Hastings, on whom we're going to spend a bit of time. 
1773. Uh, uh, so now when the governor general sits, so he is the governor general of India and he is the governor of Bengal as well. He holds both positions at the same time. Uh, the other presidencies like Madras, Bombay, they have their own governors. And as gradually as British rule expands, we're going to find that there are going to be other people who are going to be appointed as governors or lieutenant governors of different provinces. Okay? Uh, the governor general of India ha has a council of four members, none of whom can be a company employee. All right. So th this is one of the things that Parliament wants to be sure about, that the company doesn't really have a say. Warren Hastings, let me talk about him a bit. All right. Uh, so I've now, because he's the first governor general appointed in 1773, um, and I'm anticipating the, the, uh, the, the narrative, but just so that you know, 1789, he's going to be impeached. Okay. Uh, in fact, this is probably, without exaggeration, one of the two or three most famous trials in British history. Right? His impeachment proceedings are going to last for seven, eight years. Uh, and he's going to be impeached by one of the probably the greatest orator of the day, uh, Edmund Burke. Um, uh, uh, also author of a very famous book on reflections of the revolution in France. Right? So uh, it's, it's a high drama. It's high, high drama what's going to happen with Warren Hastings later on. However, Warren Hastings had come to India in 1750, came from a poor family, in fact, actually, originally, then goes to, goes to uh, 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 English grammar boarding school, something like that, Westminster, I think it was, uh, and uh, comes to India in 1750. He's an employee of the company. Um, he's not in the military service of the company. He's, he's in the commercial uh, so, you know, uh, is working basically as a trader and all of that. Uh, uh, he's going to be uh, part, uh, uh, part of, um, uh, but, but, you know, the fact that he's not in the military service doesn't mean that he's not going to perform military functions at some point because uh, eventually we're going to find that he's even going to be uh, taking part in re the relief uh, of Fort William uh, when it was under siege later on, right? And when Clive went to rescue uh, people from the so-called black hole. Uh, so Warren Hastings is part of that. The easiest way to understand all of that is that in some ways he's a protege of Clive, a protege of Clive. Unlike Clive, however, he did not amass a massive personal fortune in India. Uh, right? At least that's the standard story. I'm not saying he was a pauper. I'm not saying he was poor. Uh, it's just that he wasn't filthy rich. And he didn't uh, exploit India to the degree to, prob to which Clive is at least alleged to have exploited India. Uh, so he go, he's, he, he's uh, in fact, he's going to return to India uh, uh, in 17, uh, if I recall correctly, about December 1764, uh, return to Britain uh, in December 1764. Uh, and about four and a half years later, realizing that, you know, he's not really making much headway in England. He's not able to really a mass of, uh, you know, the kind of wealth that he wanted to, uh, he wants to actually go back to India. So he's going to beseech the company to send him back, and, and then 1769, he's going to head back uh, to India, uh, which is where he's going to end his career before he returns to England for good. Uh, and 1773, as I said, he becomes um, the governor general. Uh, right? So that's the bare outlines. Now, we haven't gotten to the real narrative about Warren Hastings yet. Uh, we shall do so shortly. Uh, one last thing here uh, uh, to fill up the picture uh, of what's happening 1760s to 1780s. Uh, in a way, a minor detail, in a way, not. There is an office of the examiner of correspondence. So when I'm talking about the company structure, the structure of the company, company's headquarters in London, in in India, the company's headquarters are now Calcutta, uh, but of course a company has a presence elsewhere too, you know, Bombay, Surat, Madras, all of that. So there is correspondence between the company in England and the company in India. And this uh, uh, correspondence is handled, it's 
by the office of the examiner of correspondence. It's channeled through this office. All right. Um, and it's, in a way, it's a minor administrative detail, but it's not, because the office of the examiner of correspondence becomes a vital position. It's a, it's a vital position because think about it. You know, I, I just want to share uh, this information with you because you get a little sense of, okay, how policy is actually made at this point in time, moving into the next several decades, all the way until uh, the end of the company in a way, right? How is policy really made? So let's go back for a second. Uh, good illustration and, and you can see that as I pointed out in my opening lecture and in the syllabus I'm not always going to adhere to the chronological framework because there are analytical arguments, theoretical arguments that we have to think about. So here's Avad. I've mentioned Avad to you already in a number of contexts. You know the Nawab of Avad here. Uh, the Nawab is the king of Avad. Uh, the British, this is adjoining Bengal. So you can see that there's an immediate concern for a number of reasons, that if you're going to expand, it's logical, isn't it, that you would expand into contiguous territories, that you would first move into territories that are closer to you. Uh, uh, and the Nawab of Avad is a very powerful person. Uh, uh, it's an extraordinary court, an extraordinary court. I'm going to return to that part of the story later on. The Nawabs are Shias. Uh, and uh, it's in many ways a highly cosmopolitan culture. They have close uh, links with Iran uh, as well. All right. Now, uh, uh, the Nawab of Avad is a man that the British characterized as the quintessential oriental despot because the claim was that the Nawab of Avad neglected his subjects. Um, and in fact, all, the, all uh, th throughout the the late 1700s uh, until the annexation of Avad in 1856, the argument was that the king not only neglected his subjects, but the kingdom had fallen into ruin. You know, okay, the, 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 uh, that there was revenue extraction, but it was unjust, that those who were supposed to pay revenue didn't, those who couldn't were being taxed. Uh, the kings of Avad, the British very often pointed out, were more fond of writing poetry and flying kites and smoking the hookah. That was at least how the British put it. So the quintessential despots. Now in 1801, uh, uh, several decades after our story here, the British uh, are going to enter into an agreement okay, with the Nawab of Avad. Uh, and, and so these, these rulers, they're called native rulers. They're called native rulers. They enter into an agreement, and the agreement has to do with, you know, what are going to be our privileges and our rights, and, uh, and what can we do in return for you. Remember that 1800, the company has become by far the major political military force in India. So let's say the Nawab has internal dissent. Well, the company says, we'll help you contain that dissent. We'll help you control that dissent, okay? But in return, you have to give us something. You might have to pay a tribute to us. You might have to pay us a certain sum of money, right? If you want our troops, the company is true, because remember, the East India Company has its own armies, right? Um, the Bengal army being the big one here, and then, you know, the, ar the other armies of the company in other presidency towns, right? So uh, why do I uh, mention this? Because if we look at uh, Avad over here, we're going to find that this story is going to continue for the next several decades. Throughout, okay, the 1810s, 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And eventually then, in 1856, the British are going to annex. Right? Now why did I start this story? Because remember I was talking about the office of the examiner of correspondence. And I was saying, let's try to understand how policy is actually created. Now, throughout these decades, there is extensive correspondence between the company's officials in India and the officials back in London. And they're saying, okay, they're reporting. This is what's happening. The British appoint a person. He's called the resident. 
So this is, he's, you can think of him as an ambassador. If you wanted to use modern day language that you might understand, he's an ambassador. So he's the, the ambassador of the company to the court of the Nawab of Awadh. The resident then goes around the district and he writes a report and every report that the re and every resident writes is a damning indictment of what's happening there. And the question that is constantly coming up from the early 1800s is, why don't we just take over Awadh? Why let it remain as an independent kingdom? Now this is a calculation that they have to make. Well, if we take it over, then we have responsibility. Then it means, ah, we're going to have to put in revenue, right? We're going to run, run this as part of our territories. Isn't it more advantageous to let the Nawab retain jurisdiction over his territories, but we get a certain tribute? In fact, we're getting some money. Um, but, but of course, what's happening, this is where it's getting complicated. By the 1820s, 1830s, the British are also saying that we are not just here to extract revenue. In fact, the company is really, frankly, no longer really doing much trading by the 1820s, as we're going to find out. Right? Uh, what's become more important is, what is the primary function of a state? To secure, to offer security to its subjects. And translate that, the primary responsibility is the enforcement of law and order. Law and order. Right? And if, if the British are going to say, hey, you know, we deserve to be rulers, it's because, hey, under Oriental rule, there is no law and order. It's lawlessness. It's chaotic. Law and order, by the way, how important that is. Remember that the last tweet by Trump last night, I'm going to set the feds into Chicago. Why? Because it's gun violence. What is translated? Law and order. I'm going to impose law and order because, you know, the mayor of Chicago is, isn't able to do it himself. Right? You see, that, that's... So the company has to think... So now the thing is, if you're going to annex, there is a grounds for annexing, they think. Right? The grounds are that we need to impose law and order. We have to provide a civilizing mission to these people, et cetera, et cetera. We look at all of these arguments in greater detail. All of this, which I've given you hints of the story here, but all of this is, goes back to the question of how is policy created? So there's this correspondence going on. How is it being channeled? It's being channeled through the office of the examiner of correspondence. Who is the examiner of correspondence in the 1830s? Okay, and 1840s. First, James Mill. One of the two or three most well-known British social thinkers in the first half of the 20th century. And then who is going to succeed him? His own son, the great philosopher of liberty, John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill spent his entire adult working life virtually as the examiner of correspondence. He is writing all of these policy documents by the way, all of these policy documents, there are hundreds of them, which have 99% have never been published, justifying what the British are going to do. So justifying the annexation of Awadh in 1856, justifying the annexation of another place called Jhansi a couple of years before that. But all of this goes back to the 1820s, 30s. All of this correspondence is being channeled through this office, right? So that's the importance of this office, and it gives you a little sense of how policy is actually being created. Because when he writes a document saying, well, this is what I think the company should do, then that document goes to London, then the officials in London will, will annotate the document and say, well, we agree or don't agree with this aspect. Then it goes back, okay? It goes back to Calcutta, and then it goes back again. It may go back and forth. In the case of Awadh, the correspondence goes on for over 50 years before the annexation takes place in 1856. All right, I'm going to stop over here, and we'll resume the narrative.